I was saying that. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. I'll do an introduction. Uh, this is a meeting of the Board of Zoning Adjustments. Um, tonight, we have, I think, one item, Robbie, right? Correct. And, um, on each item, staff will present first and the applicant second. Next, the public will be invited to comment and then the board will discuss. Not going to review voting rules right now because we have some decorum rules that Devin are, is going to introduce. So, Devin, your turn and I'll pour my tea. I'll be right back. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Um, is everyone able to see my screen? Okay. Awesome. So uh, being that there is one public engagement uh, item for tonight, um, did wanna go over some rules of decorum for that engagement section. Uh, so the city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and board and commission members, as well as the democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. The following are some examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Municipal Code and other guidelines that help support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to identify themselves using the name they are commonly known by and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is permitted online. When we do get to the section public engagement, there will be an opportunity to raise your hand um, and that will let myself and the rest of the board know you are interested in public comment. Um, if you can see this, the little arrow, at the blue arrow at the bottom of the screen there, that's pointing towards the raise hand function. Um, when we get to this part, all you have to do is click that raise hand function, and that will, excuse me, let everybody know that you're interested in public comment. There are two other options, uh, three other options for public comment and to raise your hand there. Uh, a couple shortcuts. Um, if you click, if you're on a PC, you can click Alt Y, Option Y for a Mac, or if you're on a, a phone, you can click Star Nine. And all three of these options will let you raise your hand for the public comment. And with that, the, the decorum rules are done there. Um, <clears throat> I did want to go ahead and uh, since this is Drew's first meeting here, um, I have the oath of office for Drew uh, so he can officially be a, be a member here. Um, Drew, if you could uh, kind of on my, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself and then raise your right hand and repeat after me. I will go ahead and read your oath of office and then we'll get you sworn in here. All righty. I, Drew Eisenberg, do solemnly swear. I, Drew Eisenberg, do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Colorado. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the state of Colorado. I, I don't know why my video just stopped. Did it stop for you? Yeah. There you go. Oh, there we go and the charter and ordinances of the city of Boulder. And the charter and ordinances of the city of Boulder. And faithfully perform the duties of the office of a member of the Board of Zoning Adjustment. And faithfully perform the, the duties. Perform the duties. Of the office of a member of the Board of Zoning Adjustment. Of the office of the Board of Zoning Adjustment. Which I am about to enter. Which I'm about to enter. Congratulations, Drew, and welcome to the Board of Zoning Adjustment. Thank you. Hi, Drew. <laughs> Can you, um, do you want to just, we, we should introduce ourselves, you should introduce yourself, so. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, I, I don't usually use Zoom, so um, I'm not sure why the, the video button kept on cutting itself out, so uh, I'll just turn it back on when it turns off. Um, yeah, I'm Drew Eisenberg, um, and I, okay. kind of weird. It's, it's very weird. Um, so uh, I actually applied for a variance uh, two years ago, um, and I got very interested in uh, all the zoning regulations and um, yeah, just uh, generally uh, found it very interesting and had lots of opinions on uh, the different matters going past the board. And so I decided to apply. Um, I actually, <laughs> I think Jack Rudd uh, did a fantastic job and um, I, I didn't know he was going to apply. Uh, if I had known, I mean, maybe I would not have. But he he wasn't committal, and, and back in January, um, and I guess City Council uh, just chose fresh blood. 
Um, so um, yeah, here I am. I'm really excited to uh, contribute and um, yeah, uh, volunteer for the city. And then from a, from a professional background, uh, so I'm an engineer by trade. Uh, so I actually design uh, wind turbines, um, the aerodynamics of wind turbines. Um, but uh, I have, uh, you know, history uh, with the designing um, my own house, and then also, um, you know, working with uh, architectural plans and blueprints and so forth. So I'm very capable of of understanding and reading all of those. Um, and uh, bring a very analytical perspective. So uh, yeah, very criteria based. Thank you, Drew. I appreciate the introduction and welcome to the board. Thanks. Um, we'll go around and introduce ourselves. Uh, I will just say, for, it's, it's probably helpful for everybody to know that there's, if it's a formal or an informal policy, but the council tries to keep uh, board appointments for five years and have people move on to other boards. And so there will always be a preference for somebody new over, at least that's what I've been told. So um, in, in how set in stone that is, I don't know, but I ran into it myself. And so that's how I feel like I can speak from experience. Um, it is my second term on the board, but it is a little unusual. Not in, it depends on how many applications there are in the past people didn't apply to this board. So people were on for a longer period of time. So thank you for applying and being here. We'll miss Jack, but it sounds like you'll bring your own um, background to us. Thank you. Um, who else would like to introduce themselves next? Just physically raise your hand, it would be great. Otherwise I'll call on you, so. Nobody's gonna volunteer? Nikki, come on. All right, Marine volunteer. So well, you, you're off the hook for a minute. Go, Marine. Drew, Drew knows me because we know each other outside of um, of of this. <laughs> Drew and my husband work together um, and in the wind industry, um, and so we know each other a little bit. So I don't know that I need to <laughs> introduce myself <laughs> yeah. for myself formally. But hi, Drew. It's nice to have you. Yep. Good to see you. Okay, Nikki, now I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Hi, Drew. Um, nice to have you as part of the board. My name is Nikki McCord. Um, I do not work in the housing industry, um, but or construction industry. Um, I've served on the Boulder Housing Partners Board in the past, and I'm a resident of Boulder. Happy to have you here. Thanks. Katie. Uh, um, hi. Hi, Drew. Uh, I am pretty new. I'm the second newest member now to, to the Boza board. So you're in good company. I, I joined last fall. So a lot of this is, is still new to me too. Um, and this is the first board in Boulder that I've served on. Um, and my husband and I have lived in Boulder since 2007. Um, and uh, uh, that, that's about it. I'm a freelance writer. And um, other than that, my husband and I live um, in, towards the West End and, and just wanted to do my part in serving on a Boulder board. Thank you, Katie. And I'm uh, Jill Lester. I have a few things in my back pocket, but um, I have a law degree um, and ended up in real estate uh, building um, single family custom homes, doing a little bit of tenant finish over the years, and um, also work for CU uh, part time, which I've done. And, and I've been a teacher as well. So I kind of different backgrounds and, and so definitely have a building uh, background uh, and a familiarity with the code from that standpoint. So uh, welcome, Drew. It's nice to um, meet you. Thank you. I look forward to working together. So um, the next thing that happens is that um, we'll review the voting rules um, so that, you know, so first what happens is I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. Um, staff, which means Robbie will present um, the variance request and then the applicant has the opportunity to speak. Public comment will be followed and the board will discuss. There is usually some board discussion after Robbie speaks. So we sort of have two times in there where we speak. 
when we have a full board, which we do tonight, an affirmative vote of three or more board members shall result in passage of a motion. An applicant cannot be approved with less than three affirmative votes. So basically we have a quorum at three. And if the first vote taken on a motion to approve or deny an application results in a tie of two to two, the applicant shall be allowed a rehearing. A tie vote on any subsequent motion to approve or deny shall result in defeat of the motion and denial of the application. A vote of two to one or one to two on a motion shall in all respects be considered a tie. So um, that, unless you have any questions on that, I will move on to the evening's uh, agenda. Um, let me just pull up the number. This is, I don't have this open here. And our first item for tonight is um, the one that I mentioned earlier on Alpine. Might have to give me the number if my computer doesn't want to wake up here. Okay, there we go. Um, so for um, this application is um, BOZ 2023, basically four, right? Followed by, it's four zeros and a four. Is that right, Robbie? That is correct. And over to you. Okay, let me share my screen real quick. Okay, you should see the presentation up on the screen right now. This is again, docket number BOZ 2023-00004. The address is 1951 Alpine Avenue. And this is a setback variance. As part of a proposal to recognize and permit an approximately 72 square foot detached sauna structure within the property's front south yard, the applicants are requesting a variance to the front yard landscape setback standards for accessory structures in the RL1 zoning district. The resulting front yard setback will be approximately three and a half feet where 55 feet is required and three and a half feet exists today. Section of the land use code to be modified, section 971 Boulder Revised Code 1981. And up on the screen, you see the approximate location of the property there circled in red. And as a part of the application, there were four neighbors that provided written support within the application materials. And those properties are to the west, east, and then two properties to the south across Mesa Drive, and those are denoted as the green stars that you see up on the screen right now. And the existing residence, this is an aerial as well as a site plan or survey of the existing residence. The variance tonight is not specific to the house itself, but an accessory structure or sauna structure um, that is considered an accessory structure within the land use code. That is not shown on the screen, um, but the next screen will show it. Um, and this was all provided within the application. It detailed the existing conditions of the site. And um, I won't go through all of these, but in case we do need to come back to these photos, um, I just wanted it within the presentation for the board to be able to look at and discuss if needed. Um, but we can come back to this, um, the photos of the existing conditions if needed. So tonight, the board is looking into or considering a setback variance, again, for a new roughly 72 square foot sauna structure. And the specific variance being considered is um, to the front south yard, and that's for approximately three and a half feet from the subject sauna, where 55 feet is required and approximately three and a half feet exists today. And the image on the left um, was an image that did show the location of the sauna. It is out there today. And um, I believe, and this is something the applicant might be able to talk about in a little more detail. It is a part of an overall landscape um, update to the property. And um, I believe there are current fence and retaining wall permits out there approved, um, but those, are not associated with the sauna. The sauna requires separate approval. But the image you see up on the screen, both the left and the smaller right kind of shows the exact location of the subject uh, detached sauna structure that is out there today. And photos of that were also provided. And I'll show those here in a second. 
Um, but that is the request that the board is considering this evening. And these are just some rendering showing the um, location from all angles of the subject um, sauna structure um, related to standing on the street. And this is the structure itself. And the pictures on the bottom um, are the existing conditions. Again, you can see some of the site work happening as a part of the overall um, landscaping project. And then the subject structure tonight, which is um, technically in the property's front yard setback and the requirement for accessory structures within a front yard is 55 feet. So the request tonight is for a three and a half foot setback from that south property line where 55 feet would otherwise be um, required for any um, accessory structure. And a little bit in the way of some zoning information, the property is zoned R01 and the lot size is 6417. Um, about 500 and some change below square feet um, below the maximum, the minimum allowance for R01 lots, which is typically 7,000 square feet. And exposed proposed building coverage, the max allowed for this property is around 2333 square feet. And this building is actually exempt from building coverage per our definition due to its size and height. Um, if it's under 10 feet and less than 80 square feet, it does not count towards building coverage. And then for existing and proposed floor area, a max allowed for the property is 3,383. And the proposed, including the roughly 72 square foot detached sauna is gonna come to about 2,304, which is well under the maximum allowance for the overall property. And solar access, as well as side yard wall articulation and side yard bulk plane, because of the location and the size and design of the subject sauna structure, um, all three of these are not impacted um, or create any sort of violations. And then the history, the home was built circa 1951. As mentioned, there were two recent permits associated with the landscaping changes. Those were fence permits, which also includes retaining walls. Um, within or in 2020 and then another one in 2027 and there are no um, compliance cases um, active on this property at this time. So all that being said, staff is recommending support of the setback variance as it has been presented within BOZ 2023-04. Um, and I can go into the review criteria in a little more detail if the board wants. But in short, we recognize the restrictions and that more importantly, the shape of the lot and then the location of the existing house as a hardship to any development, um, regardless of its size on the lot, because there is um, essentially no buildable space to the north or east of the existing house. And what is kind of treated and what appears to be a backyard of the property um, is technically the front yard due to a continuous front um, yard along the south span of the property. So recognizing the site restrictions and the, as well as the size and scope of the structure. And then also um, we have some neighbors and so we have four neighbors in support, um, the most impacted properties to be more specific. Um, staff does feel that it would not, you know, negatively impact the essential character of the surrounding properties and there is neighbor support. So all that being said, we are recommending support of the application as has been presented. So um, I will leave it at that. And if you have any other questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those. Does anybody have questions for Robbie? I guess the only question I would have um, then is if this was a shed under, is it 80 square feet or 42? I can't remember what that. It's 80. 80 square feet. And this is 72. Um, could a shed be placed there or would they have to come in and get a variance for a shed? Store so shed? a structure under 10 feet and less than 80. Um, and that is not hooked up to utilities or electric, and this is coming from building code, um, does not require a building permit and is exempt from some like coverage. 
some areas, but I believe, and the applicant can probably speak to this more specifically, any structure, regardless of its size, if it is hooked up to electric or utility would require a building permit review, which would happen after tonight's decision, pending tonight's decision. So sometimes sheds do not require a building permit, but they do require compliance with the setbacks, regardless of if there's a permit or not. So a lot of times that um, people assume if you don't need a permit, um, you don't have to meet the setbacks. That is not the case. You still have to meet setbacks. And so in order for it to meet setback, it would have to go through variance process, whether this was a shed because Correct. it's in, essentially in their front yard. Correct. Okay. Those, that was my only question. Nikki, yeah, please. Thank you. Ronnie, can you help me understand the purpose of a setback? Um, yes, in general, it's to more honor spacing between properties, whether that's spacing from a street or spacing from a side um, to kind of help with neighbors. So it's really to provide open space and overall visual kind of separation, whether that's from a street or a neighbor. So a lot of times side setbacks are less than front and back because a front setback a lot of times will involve visual setback from a street and the rear is to provide kind of you know private um, amenity space for a property and then sides are more to kind of respect for both um, fire and safety but in addition just visual separation amongst neighbors but the 25 feet in between would be almost impossible for most structures so it has side setbacks are reduced to more of a five to ten foot separation so front really has to do with maintaining front yards visual distance from a street rear for private use and enjoyment of a home um, and then sides kind of for the same reasons to kind of provide just a visual and privacy separation from your neighbors immediately to the side and then not all properties are perfectly square in boulder so we run across some situations where a backyard is not necessarily a typical backyard and same for front and side. So setbacks are strictly visual like considerations. What I, what I guess I'm trying to understand is, are there any health or safety reasons why we have set, setbacks? I did hear you say in terms of the side setbacks for fire, but I want to know in this and a front setback, are there any health or safety reasons why we have self setbacks? For front and back, no, I cannot think of any unless there was some sort of an easement, which this property does not have. A lot of times you'll see utility or access easements in place, and those kind of act as setbacks for specific reasons. Um, but that's not every property in Boulder. And this property does not have easements. So you are correct on that. Thank you, Robbie. Also, wouldn't you say, Robbie, that easements, utility easements are typically running along the front or the back and not on the typically, side? Yeah, typically, yes, not always. <laughs> not always, right. Okay. Anyone else? Drew. And I guess um, what we're really approving, though, is the uh, size and shape and location of an accessory structure. The fact that it's a sauna is it could it could change their they can choose the use as they wish is that correct that's correct the board doesn't typically look at the specific use within and um you are approving specifically the setback that three and a half foot from the front yard but overall the the general bulk of the building is what you're approving so pending tonight's decision were it to be approved um they could not make it taller or bigger or closer. Um, you are approving the location and the general bulk of the building, not the design or, spe or um, specific use. But the size, right? But the size, yes. Yeah. Size and location. Any other questions before we, do, is there an applicant presenting? As I don't, I can't see them, Devin? Um, yes, we do have, we, sorry about that, mess, Madam Chair, we do have two folks uh, who are here to present for the applicant's presentation. So at this time, um, I think we're finished with staff questions and we'll move into the applicant's presentation. Um, welcome. 
And then Ransom, are you going to do the uh, presentation? Should I start with okay. you? Um, actually, do you want to start with Kyle, who's the yeah. homeowner? He just joined yeah. as well. Absolutely, Kyle. Uh, welcome Hello, to the board zoning adjustment. You're on. Hello, everybody. Yeah, thanks for uh, hearing us out. Um, appreciate that we get a chance to talk in front of the the Boza committee. Um, Robbie, that was a great overview of the situation. I don't have a ton more to add, although I will answer the couple things you mentioned in your, your spiel. Um, first, yeah, it, it is just an awkward property. We live on the corner of two streets, Alpine and Tyler. So we really just have one long continuous front yard, um, which caused some initial confuse, confusement on our side when we were looking at where to place the sauna. Um, we, had, we do have a small little, um, you know, more alleyway in our backyard, which is in the, the back corner. And it was just not feasible given the grade to really do anything with that land. Um, and so that's why the, the sauna is where it is right now. And it is part of a bigger landscape update to the front of the property. And the plan uh, has always been to conceal it as much as possible. We do have retaining wall and fence permits that um, we got ahead of time. Um, and that's why we're, you know, we're, we're coming to you guys again for this variance. We will go through a building permit process, as Robbie mentioned, um, because the, the sh we thought it was a shed, but it is electrified technically because there are there is a light on the front of it, and then there is a stove, obviously, because it is a, a sauna. And so, for those reasons, you know, non, you know, an electrified shed requires a building permit. So that is our our next course of action. If you guys were to so graciously approve our variance request. If you have any questions, please ask away. Thank you, Kyle. We'll we'll finish the presentation part and I'm sure people will have questions for you unless Ransom is not gonna present. So I'm not clear. I'm happy to present um, if I can share a screen and it'll mostly be a reiteration of what Robbie had shared, but let's see. Um, okay, so I'll try to uh, keep this brief, but I think uh, one point Robbie mentioned is that not all sites in Boulder are square or the same. Um, they're also not flat and that's a big consideration here. Um, if you can see the screen, the topography of uh, kind of their the site's typical backyard is uh, very steep, and actually the site to the northeast of it, it sits above. So um, when you look at all the setbacks, there was one possible buildable location, which was right here, and even to build with in conformance, um, you would be too close to the existing structure. So we were kind of pigeonholed based upon existing conditions. And as everybody has mentioned, the front yard, which is adjacent to both Tyler and Alpine, are really the two locations that are functionally uh, servable as a more traditional yard. Um, and the perceived front door is, um, even though this house is 1951 Alpine, the entry is really Tyler. Uh, this is the front door. So thinking of that as kind of the more conventional front yard, that's what sort of led to where um, we developed the plan. So if you look at the existing conditions, there's retaining walls here at the front, which lead to a flat area that is adjacent to the main living um, area of the home. And then to the Northeast, you can see the existing retaining walls that are holding back the site above it, which is an adjacent property. So um, a couple of quick things on the sauna structure itself. One thing about this is it's, uh, it's got an aesthetic quality that's maybe different than a shed in that there's high quality materials here and the structure itself is formed to kind of complement the architecture. And as a design firm, we looked at it as a real nice opportunity to actually add something of value to the character of the neighborhood. But in um, Kyle's point, we're really trying to conceal this as much as possible. So the location that we're proposing, um, what's existing adjacent to the east are several large evergreen trees. 
And then from the west, it's um, hidden by uh, the fence, which we uh, which exists today and is going to be rebuilt in a much nicer form. So it's really concealed from the general public, both in a driving and even on a um, sidewalk experience. But it does create um, just a nice backdrop here for the house. And grading wise, really the only flat reasonable part of the site is this southeast corner. Uh, there's two existing trees that we've worked really hard to preserve through our new construction. And because of that, they're on different levels of slope. So um, really the only um, flat usable area is here in the driveway, which leads to uh, the garage, of course. So, um, and to the point, I know that this is a consideration only for this structure, but I think it is important to bring up that the clients have invested um, in an overall plan, which really incorporates this structure into a greater landscape. And um, not only is it permitted, it's actually under construction as we speak. And so these are just some images of what the ultimate plan will be. And it's not um, conceptual in that we're hoping someday it'll be this. This is certainly under construction now. So you can see the um, sauna is concealed primarily by the fence, which is going in um, from if you're driving toward the east. And then from the west, you can see the large evergreens on the adjacent property. Um, and then the size and scale of the sauna, we feel complements the home nicely um, and doesn't contribute to any sort of solar offset issues. Um, and it, just the quality of materiality, even when you do see it, is a very pleasant structure, something that's much nicer than a shed. And um, as uh, one thing that we would just like to kind of mention is we do have neighbor support from um, all the adjacent properties, especially the two to the south, which are uh, most highly impacted visually by this structure. So hopefully that's a, a good overview. Again, thank you, like Kyle said, for listening to um, our presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you, Ransom. Board, questions? Yes, Katie? I just had a quick question. So is, is the sauna right up against the fence, essentially? It is not. It's actually set back three and a half feet from the fence. From the fence, okay. Nikki, sorry. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. Um, hi, thanks for the presentation. Sorry. Can you help me understand the order of operations? So the structure as of like April 11th today exists on the property. So can you help me understand the order of operations in terms of how is the property there before the Bulls at Board has made a decision on whether to grant the variance? Ransom, do you want me to say that? Uh, go ahead, I can fill in if you want. Yeah, or... great. Nikki, that obviously is the 800 pound uh, grill in the room. Um, so we applied for several permits, fence permit, uh, retaining wall, different retaining wall permits. And we did a full sort of permitting scope, figuring out what needed a permit, what didn't need a permit. And we, when it came to the sauna, we were just a little bit confused whether it counted as a shed or not. Um, and so that was, that was the primary issue. We thought it was a shed and, you know, we thought, you know, Hey, this isn't that different from a shed that someone might, you know, string a light bulb to, and, you know, be able to turn on and off. Um, but it, uh, as we learned more and more in the process after it got delivered, um, it was brought to our attention that, you know, this really, this really was something a little bit different It really is an accessory structure. Um, and so that was, the confusion on our part and uh you know we take responsibility for it but and, th and that's why we're we're sort of applying for the variance after the the sauna had been installed and delivered uh rather than the the other way around uh, we much would have preferred to be here before you without the sauna currently where it is and and asking for a, a setback so we could install it that would obviously be the ideal order of operations thank you Other questions? Drew? 
I, I, um, I see you unmuted, so I'm assuming that you want to ask. Yeah. Something. yeah. Um, uh, could you talk about a little bit about the the buy right solutions uh, that you considered? Um, the as far as I guess the, you, you, with the regards said, to the shed. Yeah. Um, so, can I just say one thing, Drew? I, I'm, it's a fine question to ask. I think it's been answered um, because they, that's what they were talking about in the backyard where the by right solutions are. So if you'd address that, so explain, so using the word by right, uh, you didn't bring that word up, but you did explain. So I think if, if you went over that and explained that it would be more clarifying. Absolutely. Um, so by right, there's setbacks to the front sides and backyard. Uh, the rear yard setback, I believe is three feet. The side yard setbacks are five feet on one side and 10 on another. And that um, starts to bring that triangle that's in the back uh, and compresses it. And so when we looked at the size of the sauna structure by right, um, once we placed that in the plan, it would be closer than nine feet from the primary structure, which is also a violation. So essentially nowhere in that area could we have actually placed this structure legally by right without another variance. Um, looking at that particular area, the grading and topography was such that it would be a really um, heavy undertaking to actually place the structure there. And then we would again have to come back and um, have a variance process anyway. So when we looked at all the other options on the site and at the time operating under the assumption that this was a shed, the most logical place was where it was placed. Um, and the code wording is a little bit vague and the size of the structure is actually under the size of a shed. So that was where the assumption had been mis misleading on our part. And um, once it was brought to our attention that because of that utility component, this would be considered more than an accessory structure. That's when we, or excuse me, more than a shed. That's when we started this process. I guess, uh, Robbie, could you comment? I don't know if you evaluated um, putting the shed in the uh, backyard area. I, I think it's six feet clearance with the main structure. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, and staff did evaluate kind of could there be a buy right or meeting code um, location for this. And the rear and side setbacks, so the northwest and east setbacks for an accessory structure are three feet. And then the front is 55 feet. So with that in mind, we also have to take into consideration, as you mentioned, Drew, building separation. So between two buildings on a property, and that's including roof overhangs and anything attached to it, there's no less than a six foot requirement. So um, it's not just setbacks, but also building separation that has to be taken into consideration. And um, with all that staff to look at the um, somewhat smaller um, non-typical backyard, as well as the topography of that space. And we agree with what Ransom and Kyle mentioned. It's um, not feasible to put any structure within what is technically the rear yard of the property. And then same for the side yards. There just wasn't, didn't seem to be any buildable space for even an accessory structure. And then that leaves the front yard, that 55 foot south span, which eliminates a lot more of the developable area. So staff did take into consideration the setbacks, the building separation, as well as kind of the buildable area, the overall topography and site conditions um, when um, considering our recommendation. So, yep, that's a good point to make is there's also building separation to take into mind. Thank you, Nikki. Please. Thanks for that explanation, Robbie. Then I, I have another question then in terms of that backyard. When you were considering the setback for the backyard, was it based upon the current size of the structure? And if the structure was a different size, would it have, would, could it have gone there by right? Uh, it's kind of both. That's a very good point. Specific to this recommendation, we did mostly just use the proposal at hand, the 72 square foot, nine um, foot tall structure, and still found it somewhat um, 
unfeasible, not easy to put it simply to put that specific structure in the location. Um, but definitely not a large or like a typical one car garage definitely could not go back into that space. So for this recommendation, we specifically looked at the 72 square foot sauna structure when determining whether or not staff would provide support. So, and if you can't answer this question, please don't, but if, if this variance was brought to you in, in the conception phase, and we were considering what size structure could fit by right and what size structure could not fit by right, would that be something that you all would talk to the applicant about and, and make a consideration about? There might be discussion, but it's really hard to say what would and what would not feasibly fit within, for example, that backyard space. So there might have been a discussion like that, but it very likely would have come to the same conclusion, which is it's a very limited topographically kind of restricting area. There's a lot of grade change even within that small north yard, the rear yard. So specifically, um, there's no I don't think there would have been a, this is the size that would work. And that is not typically something staff does. We usually just guide them and recommend if there is a buy right meeting code um, design solution or location, that's always the best path forward. This one, um, preliminarily, it probably would not have been easy to find a buy right meeting code location for any structure. Um, but that discussion was not made. So I can't really say um, what would have come out of it. <laughs> Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Robbie. Any other um, questions for the applicant before we go on to public? I don't know if there's anybody here from the public. Um, okay, so thank you, everybody. Um, Devin, do you have anybody here from the public who's interested in speaking to this issue? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. We do have one person in the attendees here. Um, so if you are interested in public comment on this item, please raise your hand at this time. Um, otherwise, this is this is going to be the time to offer your comment. Give them a few seconds, but I'm not seeing a hand here. And that's using the Zoom function of raising a hand, right? Mm -hmm. that, is, that is correct. Reaction, yeah. Yeah, looks like we're good, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Public hearing um, is now closed. Um, so if there's no other public comment this matter, it's now open to the board for discussion. Um, I, uh, I will, you know, as usual, um, wait one of the instructions, just so you know that, because this should be my last chaired meeting. Uh, we'll be looking for a new chair, which we didn't mention at the beginning, I think, but maybe you can start thinking about that as we go into this discussion. Um, I do have some comments on this, but I'll, I'll refrain um, from making those comments until I hear what other people have to say. Who would? Uh, one question I do want to make sure is clear. It sounds like this is either a compliance case or an issue that came up du du during the permitting, the application for the permits. Um, can I get some clarification on that? Um, I looked into that and I did not see any um, compliance cases, so I am not sure. It was, I think it was just the applicant who brought this for DeBoza, um, but I did not see any compliance cases. Thank you. And I just think that's helpful to understand that. And that's why I started off talking about the shed, because I knew that the shed piece was confusing. So I'll, I'll talk again, like I said, later. So who on the board would like to open discussion, please, if there's any further discussion? Nikki, feel free. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think I will need the help of my colleagues to convince me to vote in favor of granting this variance. Um, I'm specifically looking at H1, C, and D. Um, particularly D. So um, Drew um, 
we look at H1 and whether they um, meet all of the criteria under A, B, C, and D. And D reads, any unnecessary hardships has not been created by the applicant. And that's, that's kind of where I'm leaning right now, just because I feel like I feel like this, I feel like the order of operation could have been a lot better in taking some time to think about what could fit in the area. I do understand that in the backyard, you would have still may would have had to apply for a variance. And that works for me. Like that's cool. Uh, it's 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 okay to apply for a variance. It's just I feel like that consideration should have been taken. And so I'm I'm struggling with whether or not I'm struggling with whether this application meets that H1D criteria. Um, and then also the C, because of such physical circumstances or conditions, the property cannot be reasonable cannot reasonably be developed in conformity with the provisions of this chapter. <sighs> I'm, I, I'm not completely there. I mean, I understand that there is a possibility for it to fit in the backyard with a variance. I think, I think I just would, I, I think what I'm leaning on is I would have rather had exhausted that option before the sauna was put in place. Like, I think I would have just, I would have liked to have heard that, well, we made a plan for this, or we tried this, and, you know, this is kind of our last option, and the sauna is going to be delivered next week, and we we're trying to get a variance or whatever. I think it's the fact that the sauna is there, and it's kind of like, if we deny this application, then the homeowner is going to have to move something that's already there. So I kind of, I feel backed into a corner in terms of, well, if I vote to not have this variance go forward, now I'm saying that the homeowner has to spend all this time and effort to, to move it or to make other considerations. So I don't like being put in that position. And that's why I'm looking at H1, C, and D in terms of um, not granting this variance. Thank you, Nikki. Katie. Um, I, I, I just wanna offer that I actually, as opposed to Nikki, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of approving the variance um, simply because everything that um, Ransom and Kyle and, and Robbie have laid out sound to me sort of reasonable. And I, I sort of can track the process that the homeowner and his consultant went through, and um, you know, I I can sort of put myself in their shoes and and understand, you know, how they were initially under the assumption maybe that it would be considered a shed, and um, it turned out to be erroneous, but it's still very understandable, um, and I feel like they have gone through, you know, all. Once they realize that they have gone through all the steps that they needed to go through in order to um, request the variance. And to me, it just sounds like a very human situation that I can completely understand. And so I, I'm, I'm in favor of, of supporting it. Also, I, I always put a lot of um, weight on staff recommendations. And so the fact that Robbie and his team have sort of looked at it thoroughly sways me a lot. Um, so I, I am in favor, despite, I, I understand Nikki's concerns, but I think in spite of all that, I'm, I'm in favor of granting the variance. Thank you. Maureen, please. Thanks. Um, I actually am more on Nikki's, um, leaning more towards Nikki's um, opinions. I, um, I don't know that you can talk about a hardship if you want to install a sauna. In, at, Please pause for a moment. Our attorney has raised her hand and she has to be addressed. Please go ahead, Erin. Do you mean to have your hand raised? I, I do, and, and I can wait until after Maureen, uh, but I just wanted to talk about, for to make sure that we preserve the record, what the applicant has identified as hardship is in their materials, and it's the topographic layout. They have not mentioned having to move the 
structure as a hardship. Yeah, I, I will Thank make you, Madam that record, Chair. Aaron, uh, I, I planned on making that record. So, um, but Thanks. thank you for the reminder. Please go ahead. So yeah, please, as you are addressing um, your concerns, um, maybe I'll make do a reminder right now. We are not a punitive board here. This is, we, we're not here to punish. We are here to evaluate whether or not this meets criteria or not. Um, people do come to us after making mistakes and we are an avenue of correcting those mistakes. So we can certainly have Aaron speak to those issues and our role. So it's, it's you know, there are other comments that can be made about this, but I, it's, it's important that we stick to the criteria um, that we are required to evaluate a variance um, on. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Yeah, no, I would add that my worry is to set a precedent. If we're asked to uh, approve a 3.5 foot um, setback where 55 feet are required, and um, I'm worried about the precedent that it would create uh, potentially for other homeowners to come later. Um, Thank you. Yes, Robbie. You're muted. Yeah, you need to unmute. Yeah. Thank you. Didn't think I'd ever do that again. Um, thank you for that, Maureen. And it's staff never looks at these as you're setting a precedent for everybody to be able to do the same thing. These are all looked at case by case and on their own merit. And with this one, just to kind of respond to a few comments, staff did look at the topographic specific hardship. And then also just the general um, idea that any structure, regardless of if it's existing or not, whether or not it could go in there. Also, we recognize the general overall shape of the lot and the fact that it's substandard in size technically from 7,000 square feet. So we did take the topography and the site layout as was laid out within the applicant's materials um, when considering whether or not we agreed it met um, the criteria specifically um, C and D as um, multiple people have brought up. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Robbie. Um, Drew, do you want to say something now? Do you want? Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, well, I guess first off, um, I mean, how I view uh, these applications is I, I actually think that it's kind of irrelevant if, if um, the mistake has been already been made or not. Um, we're looking at if that form of structure can exist on that lot in, in perpetuity, right? Um, and so also take that into account with the you know, neighbors change, homeowners change, it, what we're really you know, granting is the existence of that structure in that location. Um, and I guess my, um, what I'm still not clear on, and maybe this is gonna get um, in the details, is on that, you know, criteria one uh, C uh, if it can be reasonably developed. Um, when I'm looking at the survey, Robbie, I see 26 feet between the rear of the structure and the northeast property line, and so I'm I'm just wondering why a six foot wide, six and a half foot wide structure wouldn't fit um, in those 26 feet. And that is probably a question more for the applicant, but um, the key word there is reasonably developed. Um, so it is ultimately up to board members specifically what you consider reasonable or logical kind of development of the site and also the applicant. Um, but we did look into that and kind of the way staff looked at it was that entire front 55 feet is non-developable land and would require a setback, but a lesser variance might be possible. That's something that the applicant would need to speak to, um, but we considered it an appropriate location given multiple circumstances and the overall topography and layout of the site. Um, so with that, we agreed that this was um, a reasonable and what works best for the applicant and shifting it to another location would still result in some sort of a variance. Um, if a lesser variance is possible, that that might be a thing, but we didn't consider it inappropriate 
um, to put it in this location. So that is something we looked at as well when drafting our recommendation. Thank okay. you. Do you have another question, Drew? Or um, well, I guess uh, where I'm leaning is um, I, I tend to believe that a, a lesser variance would be possible, um, especially in the backyard um, in the north northeast corner. Um, and then I also on um, you know in terms of the the character of the neighborhood, um, you know I, I do you know, feel, uh, we were talking about the, what are the purposes of setbacks? Uh, you know, I think setbacks uh, also create the character of a neighborhood. Um, and then, you know, having a uh, front yard accessory structure uh, definitely impacts that character. Um, so so to me, the two criteria that I am um, questioning are, are 1C and uh, 5A. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for you know this is discussion. So we everybody has the opportunity to speak. We can have further discussion on it. Um, I, before I talk, I would like to ask Ransom to address the issue um, that Drew has brought up, and maybe Robbie as well. Um, it is so. I live in this neighborhood. I don't live close enough to be eliminated by you know to vote on this because I'm not that close. But I'm very familiar with this site. It is a very difficult site to work with. And so I don't know if each of you had the opportunity to drive by and take a look at it. And I, um, so although I think what Robbie's saying is we could look at other locations on the site, this is what was brought to us and we considered it reasonable. And so I think, Ransom, if you would just review the location that Drew has raised and make sure we're all in agreement and understanding whether it is topography, difficulty of access, and so on. And again, this is not me talking about where, I'm, where I am right now. This is me asking for clarification in response to Drew's question. Yes, um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, weigh in on that. Can I share my screen again? Please. Okay. Okay. Oops. Okay. Um, the area I believe <clears throat> that Drew is mentioning is this corner here. And while the survey shows 26 feet back, um, I don't know if it's clear what the topography is doing. So the elevation here, and this is, I'm going off memory a bit, but the um, elevation at this point compared to the elevation of the floor of the house is something like 14 or 16 feet in change of elevation here. Um, I would have to verify that with the actual survey, but it's it's a significant slope. And um, the challenge with placing it back here is not only is it a significant slope, it continues to slope to the property that's further above it. And so anything you do in here would require, I, I would say it would require more variance than just a simple variance because it would require um, significant retaining walls that could potentially exceed the height of retaining wall that is considered acceptable to create a structure in this location. Um, one of the things that I know it says in the packet as a hardship is did the applicant choose, um, I, I am, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but the uh, route of the least amount of, um, I guess, challenge and minimum I feel hardship. like, yeah, the minimum hardship. So we feel like placing it in this location would require um, a lot more than just a simple variance because if it was a flat site, that would certainly make a lot of sense. But with the amount of um, topography and grade change that you have here in this particular location, uh, that's where the hardship really became a challenge. Uh, the existing retaining walls that are on site are 
holding up the grade, but um, it would be compromising all of them if we were to try to place a structure in this location. And so that's why we thought placing it here would be the least amount of environmental impact on the site for one. And then two would be um, a variance process that would be simpler than this entire corner here. And just one thing to add to what Ransom mentioned, our neighbor to the east, who that slope continues into their yard, they actually, they have a small gate and a pathway that comes uh, right along the property right there. I'm not sure if it's in the pictures Ransom or not, um, but that goes from their kitchen area down to their parking area where their garage is. And I really, you know, we really didn't want, you know, to impact them. I mean, because I agree with Drew, Drew in theory, the back, this little backyard area would be ideal for something like this. Um, but the, the, the access issue is huge, getting equipment back there to build the retaining walls. I mean, we did look into it. It's just not, it wasn't feasible um, without really disturbing um, our neighbor's yard and that, that little small walkway that they, they already have that we also wanted to preserve. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you again, everybody. And you can stop sharing if you want to for now, Ransom, thank you. Um, so, you know, having the longest history here on the board, I'm gonna bring up a couple of other, uh, one, one other case in particular where we looked at a front yard shed situation. Um, maybe Aaron and Robbie remember this, was over on Arapahoe where um, a fairly small shed, 40 square feet was, built in the front yard setback. And um, we spent a lot of time talking about it. A lot of time, it was one of those very long meetings. And um, ultimately in that case, there were multiple other spots not preferable to the homeowner on that site where this shed could be relocated. And that's what it came down to. And I don't think, I think we denied that application um, is my recollection, or we sent them back to figure it out and then they didn't come back again. Um, so one thing I wanna remind uh, Ransom and Kyle about is depending on how the vote goes, um, we, can, we can talk about those options when we go, when we're, before we vote. So we, we won't move to voting until, because there's some consequences to us having a final vote that affect you um, I think part of what, so I'm not particularly too much on the fence with this, but I would say that there might be this little bit of, okay, it's a sauna sense for me of like, is this necessary? But that's not our criteria. Okay. So that's, that's something I personally have to just step back from and say, this could be a shed with a little electricity, this could be somebody's she shed. This could be any number of things. And knowing the location and knowing the site and looking at this enormous front yard and no other buildable area or accessible area on the site, I just have absolutely no problem seeing that the topography is a serious hardship to the development of this. And I, I lean toward Katie. I, I think that this was a sincere error I understand that the shed code is confusing, um, or perhaps I wouldn't have known that if you had any power in there, because I see so many sheds with a power, you know, if you wanted to plug in any kind of a device, for example, supposing you want to hang up a weed whacker and they're now going to be electric, people are going to want to electrify their sheds and they're going to start running into this issue. So I, I personally am, am leaning towards approval of this. But it is because I do think this site is extremely difficult. And I think you, I can't even imagine trying to walk back there to that sauna. It's just not logical or she shed or any shed back there. In terms of the impact on the neighbors, you know, it's sitting behind a retaining wall that's fairly tall to begin with. And I think that was raised at the beginning in your application. But I, you know, I may be in the minority tonight, as may be Katie, and I, I, I just want everybody to, let's work with Aaron to make sure that we're making this decision 
based upon criteria and not on personal preference and not on feelings about how things progressed. Um, we don't have a compliance case here. This is not, and, and it wouldn't matter if we did, you know, it's still our job to decide based upon the criteria. So I do believe that this is a reasonable option on the site. I agree with staff's analysis and I don't always, right, Robbie? I'm not 100% just with you guys. Um, there have been times when I'm, I'm, I don't agree, but um, I just don't have a problem with it. I, I do believe that there are physical circumstances or conditions that it cannot be developed in this way. And I think some of the dispute is, should it be developed this way at all? It's not the purpose, not the use, not the fact that it's there. It's, is it reasonable to allow an accessory structure in this unusual front yard? Robbie, please. And I can wait till you're finished, Jill. I didn't want to interrupt. I think um, the notes that I, I have down here is talking about the shed, talking about the unusual topography, talking about the very large front yard. I mean, that's what's happened here is this is a huge front yard and a very tiny backyard with very difficult topography. Um, if there's, a, you know, the question I would have for Aaron is, and, and Robbie is, can we place a value judgment on the purpose of the shed versus, um, and I just don't think the criteria allow us to do that, but I, I would appreciate some clarification on that. I, I can stop. Do you wanna go first, Robbie? Uh, go ahead, Aaron, and um, I think you're gonna say something I wanted to say, so go ahead and do that, then I'll follow. Okay, There there is inherently some sort of discretionary decision to be made about the use. Um, you are approving a structure that could be a shed, an electrified shed. So looking at what is reasonable for this, this lot, this property, um, I, I guess that's how I would frame it. Um, it. Less about the interior use, but about the size of the structure, the placement, um, and, and what is reasonable. And, and we certainly over the years have seen, you know, the debate about what's reasonable for residential development. Is a two car garage uh, reasonable or should it just be a one car? And as, as times evolve, um, you know, storage needs evolve. And I think what Robbie was going to say is, is we both believe that that uh, prior case you mentioned on Arapaho, the shed in the front yard was actually approved. But do you think so? Okay. So that's helpful. So that is another situation where, but I don't remember it that way. So you have the records. I don't. Um, I looked it up and it was back in June of 2019 and it was approved. Okay. Thank you, Robbie. Cause I, I appreciate, it. I remember extensive discussion about it and ultimately um, we I, I'm going to guess we could look up the record and we can also, you know, if we have to take a pause on this tonight and come back and revisit after that, because that record is, so we have this, this situation, is it precedent? Right. <laughs> That's what I was right. going to um, share. <laughs> it's, it's not establishing precedent for other sites. It is saying every once in a while, we come up with a very unusual, difficult situation where there's a value judgment. Yes, Robbie, please. And I'm sorry, there was a, kind of a first, I just wanted to clarify the, um, it was a 40 square foot shed back in 2019, but also um, to kind of go back to something, Drew, a question you brought up, which is kind of the, the reasonable use, is there a buy right, a lesser variance? Um, it's kind of hidden in the details, but one thing that we did look into is if it could be moved closer to the house or further from the street, what would that be? And right now there's a proposed about a nine foot separation between the house and the subject accessory structure. So there's maybe uh, two to three feet of wiggle room without kicking in a variance for building separation or something like that. So there's about two to three feet that could possibly work. But again, it comes down to, is that reasonable for the applicant, the homeowner? 
um, to move the shed that two, three feet without requiring other sorts of variances. So that's on the site plan specifically where it zooms in on the structure. It kind of shows you the, the workable space um, that somebody might have um, in terms of possibly moving that shed. And then um, we still agree that the kind of the backyard and the side yard due to topography are very limited, not suitable for any structure, regardless of size due to that 10 to 15 foot uh, topography change. So I just wanted to clarify that there is a little bit of um, clarity in terms of where something could be moved within the subject front yard, and that's on the provided site plan. Do you wanna show that to us, Robbie? I think that would be- uh, Yeah, I actually have it up and um, let me share my screen real quick. And there we go. Okay, this is what I was talking about was, this is the proposed location, the three and a half foot variance to the south. And this is that nine feet in between the house and the shed. And I'm not sure if that 9.2 is taken into consideration roof overhangs, which would be um, something that we would consider. But I just wanted to kind of clarify what I meant by are there any other locations on this site where a shed, regardless of existing or proposed, could be located? Um, so the actual site conditions of the front yard itself um, were even somewhat restrictive for any structure. So this is what I was talking about, the subject detached structure site plan. And so, Robbie, is that the 72 square foot structure or is that the box in which it would have to fit? This is the actual proposed um, location um, where it is and what they're requesting for tonight. So, so as requested tonight, there would be about a nine foot two inch separation between the house and the detached structure. And as it moves closer, you have a diagonal measurement as well as the, you know, as it approaches the corner of the house or does it stay the same? So it can, it might be able to go somewhere between two and three feet, depending on the roof overhangs, slide it back further, what would that gain for people? So um, without running into issues with building separation, there might be a two to three foot. And this is, um, I'm not taking into consideration um, pathways, topography or anything, but it looks like there's about a two to three foot kind of separate or possibility of moving it north. That would then create about a, looks like a five and a half to six foot south setback. Um, not a big one, but um, it's something that I'm sure the applicant considered is a possible to make it lesser of a variance. Um, and that lesser of a variance without kicking in other variances would be about two to three feet um, before you run into building separation issues. Thank you, Robbie. Okay. I don't think I have anything to add. Do you guys want to talk some more? Do you have any comments or questions? Because we're, we'll take a straw poll before um, we vote, but let's um, let's just see if there's any further discussion. No, I just, just real quick. I, I just want to say for, for me, the things that stand out really are um, sort of the staff I feel like they re really ran it to ground and, and looked at all options. Um, and I feel like the, as you've described the difficulty of the site, you know, it, it's very hard. It sounds like it's very challenging to have tried to figure it out. And they sort of, they, they figured out an option that sounds like almost the only option that would work on this site. So that, that goes a long way for me. And, and, and 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 also the the applicants, you know, they've they've gone through the process appropriately. Um, that that weighs heavily, and um, and I don't feel like we're going to be necessarily setting any precedents. Um, and and I also just don't feel like any anything that sort of smells of value judgment about the use of you know the structure. I, I feel really uncomfortable with that. You know, this is. It, 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 it's, it's, it's their property. And, and so I don't feel like we should be getting into anything that resembles that. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Katie. 
Anyone else? Okay, and Maureen, you're still with us, right? You just have your video off. I'm here. There's a weird thing with my video. Yeah, we saw that. I saw that I earlier. Know. I was like, I think it's because it's too sunny. So it's too I was like, sunny. are you in Second Life? It <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here. It just yeah, will Thank shut down my video. <laughs> so I think the first question is, are we looking at um, a three to two um, denial? Or has anybody who expressed concerns about it um, reconsidered? I have not reconsidered, Madam Chair, and I'm leaning on um, criteria H1C in terms of me not budging. Okay, thank you. And Drew? Um, I'm, I'm kind of torn. Um, I, I, I'm also, uh, I, I really, I, I hear Robbie and, uh, Jill, um, on, on one C. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, uh, I guess it's up to us to determine what is reasonably, uh, be developed. Um, yeah, I guess yeah. There's there's a, there's a nine nine foot uh, separation in height between the the rear uh, and the first floor level, according to the survey. Um, so I yeah. Okay, thank uh, you, Drew. Yeah. And then Marine, where are you? I'm, yeah, I'm also torn, but I'm leaning towards not approving um, her criteria H1C as well. Um, so just to be clear, Aaron, can you go over what it means, H1C means? Because I'm guessing the interpretation is that they're leaning on, it's not, that is that the shed is not a reasonable development. No, I um to clarify, it's cannot be the land cannot be reasonably developed. I, I'm not convinced that um it cannot I believe that it could be um developed. So are you saying that there you believe there's a by right solution here? Um I, I mean, I, I, that, that, that's the part that I'm, you know, I, I, I walked by the site, I've looked at the survey, um, obviously Robbie has looked into this much more, uh, and obviously the applicants have looked into this much more. Um, so that's, uh, but I, you know, the, the applicant talks a lot about the, the slope of the, the rear lot being undevelopable. Um, and I mean, I, I, I you know, land dirt can be moved uh, to make um, a structure back there, and, and that's. But that, that's that's what I'm coming to. I don't, but I, I can't. I don't know. So it, it's helpful, though. What you've said is helpful to me. So it helps me to frame what I want to say to the applicant. Um, so what happens when we are divided like this? is that if we vote and turn you down, and Aaron, help me if I don't say it right, but I'm gonna go over this, right? First of all, an affirmative vote of three or more board members shall result in passage of the motion. So we have to have three or we can't pass. If the vote is a tie, it doesn't sound like we are gonna have a tie, the applicant would be allowed a rehearing. And if, um, if we tied twice, it will be a denial and, or we can do a continuance to the board. And the board may continue the hearing on a matter upon motion of a member if the motion is made and passed before passage or denial of said application, which is why we're talking about it right now. Provided, however, the movement shall publicly state the reason for the motion and the board call I don't know what this is called, shall allow both the applicant and the spokesperson of the opposition 
an opportunity to state the opposition on the proposed continuous before the vote is taken. So I need Robbie or Aaron to just go over what happens when you're turned down because it has effects. Please, Aaron. Thank you, Jill. If, if you're turned down, then you cannot reapply with a similar application for one year. So uh, the good thing about a continuance is you don't have to pay the fee again. You've heard the concerns from the members. You can take a month or to whatever date the board approves. Think about that, how you address it, how you, you know, what information you may want to provide if you come back to the board. Um, to try to address those concerns. Um, and they've all cited criteria, um, which will hopefully help you pinpoint that a little bit. Thank you, Erin. So where I'm going with this is that um, certainly we can vote. It, it feels to me, my observation is we don't have enough information. I mean, we should be able to say, there's no reasonable by right solution here. So I feel that, but I cannot point, because Drew has pointed out, there's some topographical information that we're missing. I think better imagery of the backyard to show and, and the limitations on access in order to even get back there. And you do have some pictures about that. And I know how difficult it is to get a little, you know, skidster back there and you'd be too close to the house. So how, you know, I think some help with that might um, might alleviate some of the concerns about whether or not you've actually chosen the only location on the site. Um, and that's been brought up as well, whether or not there's any movement, whether there's an appreciable difference between two or three feet. I don't know what other board members feel about that. We're dealing with a 55 foot um, rule that happens with accessory structures that cannot be met on this site very easily or even reasonably. And that should be something that should be very clear to everyone. So if it's not very clear, you have an option. So the first question is to you, the applicant, do you want us to vote or do you want a continuance? Can I take some time and, uh, and talk with Ransom? Is that possible or do I just have to make a decision right now? Aaron, it, I don't it sounds like it sounds like if we vote, it will get denied. So I'd much rather continue. And thank you again for everyone for the, your consideration. Um, you know, where we can definitely get better pictures of, of the backyard, um, explore the buy right solution a little bit more in detail, um, and just furnish everybody with more information. It would certainly, I think, make it easier for people who are unsure about this to feel like it was fully explored yeah. and, and, and not be making a decision that we're just not completely clear on. So if it's okay with you, I, I, um, board members, um, either someone can help me and make that motion or I will make the motion. Erin, I can't, can I make that motion? Yes. So the question is, is anybody opposed? I, I don't think we can oppose. Can we oppose the continuance? A board you member? could. All right, does anybody opposed to a continuance? Since no one's saying anything or raising a hand, I'm gathering there's no opposition. So at this time, uh, does anybody want to make the motion for me? Thank you, Nikki. Yes. Um, so I move to continue docket BOZ 2023-00004. Till the applicant comes back. <laughs> but no, we got to, yeah. So, and and this is, it's not your fault. So Erin, as usual, we probably need some guidance on how to word this. So typically it's one month, but usually we will extend that because one month deadline happens. Robbie could explain it if you want to jump in, but it happens like yesterday or something. And so we have, yeah, Robbie, will you explain, please? Thank you. So in the past, I believe the board has said returning no more than three months or 90 days. Um, a lot of times it is possible to come back the next meeting, but we've already hit our application deadline. It is possible. 
um, if there were any changes or modifications to the application, they could still make the May meeting. Um, that is something that would be hashed out kind of after the meeting behind the scenes with staff and the applicant. But to allow for um, enough time, uh, we typically say within to return within 90 days of tonight. The only one thing I want to bring up for you, summer months. So it is often that we do not have a full a quorum. Uh, you know, we barely get three at a meeting in the summer. And I think we've already stated that August is we're not going to have a quorum for. So I just as we do that, what is the longest extension? Could it be extended to September? They may want to come back in June or July. I don't know. But what's it, reasonable? It, it could be. It um, can be any other date that the board um, agrees upon. Uh, so I, I think we've even done six months is maybe the longest that I recall off the top of my head for something that was was very complicated. We'll pause. Thank you. Um, so I'm traveling a lot this summer. And this is, this is, this, you know, I think we need a full board there to make this decision, to make it fair to the applicant. So um, I would ask that we stay for six months. So Nikki, no, do you have enough information to make that motion? <laughs> Always need more information. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I move that we continue docket number BOC 2023-0004 until the September, oh, I, I said for six months. <laughs> May I have a second? A second. Thank you, Maureen. All those in favor, we go around the room, Drew, and because we have to record, we everyone has to say aye. So, Nikki? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Drew? Aye. Katie? Aye. And aye. So thank you so much. The motion has been approved um, to give you a continuous um, for six months. And um, hopefully you can, as Aaron said, take away from this meeting um, what you want to put into it to, to see if you can um, be more, uh, it, you can convince other board members that it's what needs to happen or not. So thank you so much for your patience with us. and. Um, your time? Yeah, Ransom, you have a question. Sorry, I just saw your hand. No, um, no problem. <clears throat> um, I just was wondering is with the application process, uh, do we submit supplemental material that is supplementary to the current application um, as we had done before? And that's how we get back on the docket. It's a Robbie question. And that's exactly what it is. I will work with you and Kyle, whoever I need to work with. Um, we could even touch base tomorrow sometime. And what it would come down to is the application is still live. It's still active. You would just provide revisions or revised materials um, as you see fit. And that's just something that's probably going to need to be determined sooner rather than later. And depending on when we can get those revisions, if there are any, um, you might be able to make the May meeting, if not the June meeting. It just depends on when we can or when you can get all that together. So you would work with me and we'd work on revising or adding to the already existing materials. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so at this time, that portion of our meeting are, is resolved. And then we just have a few things, orders of business. You gentlemen can stay or go as you wish. Um, Thank you for your, your time with us and your presentation. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have minutes to approve. So um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting? Drew, I, I don't think you can do that, but um, Katie? Yeah, I, I, I make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Katie? Aye. Green. I was in there at the um, meeting, so I'm not going to approve. <laughs> Thank you. Or deny. Or... I think that Aaron said last time, what did you say? That doesn't matter. If you, if you don't have to be there, you can still vote to approve the minutes. If you abstain, it counts as a yes vote. Okay, I abstain. <laughs>
Peggy? Aye. And I. So um, the minutes are approved from last meeting. Um, so we we certainly have a matter from the board, which is the new chair and the vice chair. Um, so how do we want to do that? Do you guys have any other stuff like city attorney planning and development to bring up? Or should we I would just say hi to Drew. Drew, I'm Aaron Poe. I'm the deputy city attorney and I work with Boza. I'm not generally one of the planning attorneys. So, so Boza is kind of my foray into Title IX usually. Um, so Robbie provides a lot of the technical expertise and I help more out on the, the code and rule interpretation. And I'll be giving the board and chair orientation on Saturday. So you'll see more of me then or on video if you're watching that via video. Uh, but but welcome. It's great to have you here. And really, we weren't trying to haze you with the Zoom video issues and by throwing a kind of an oddball one <laughs> at you right <laughs> off the bat. But thank you very much for your service. Yep. Thanks for the warm welcome. Yeah, I was hoping for an easier one to, to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> the luck of the draw. You never know. Um, so how are we going to move forward with the chair? I, I don't know how, how to do this part. I, I go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I, I I think in the past uh, there's been a general discussion about who might be interested or willing to be nominated, and then there's a, a motion for chair, a motion for a vice chair, um, with their corresponding votes in between. Uh, who would like? Who's interested in serving as the chair? Is there a reason why Jill cannot serve as the chair? <laughs> I don't think there's a reason why I can't continue as chair. Not, not legally. Not a formal one, no. <laughs> I nominate Jill to serve as chair of the Do you want to do it, Jill? I mean, I never mind doing it. Um, I, I guess one of the things I, I would I would say if I'm I I know that um, I'm traveling this summer. So someone will have to serve as a vice chair. You know, Jack and I were the senior members on the board. So I can certainly see a desire to have a senior member, but I do hope somebody will serve as a vice chair if I serve again as a chair, as the chair. Um, so is there any, like Nikki, you know, what do you think? Or Maureen? I, I would be interested in serving in vice chair. The reason why I nominated you, Jill, is because I want, if if the board wants me as the vice chair, I want to just pay more attention to what you do. <laughs> and I guarantee see. you, I have a cheat sheet just so <laughs> you know. So you you will get a cheat sheet um, for sure, and it actually needs some edits. So I'll you know try to work on that because I got these from uh, Devin. So is anybody else interested in serving? Um, because if not, then we we need a motion first for the chair and then for the vice chair. Love, love those volunteers, huh, Nikki? I, I'll, make, I'll make a motion. Okay. Can I make it all together? Can I say I make a motion for Jill as chair and Nikki as vice chair? Evidently not. Yeah, I would do them individually. Mm -hmm. All right, so I make a, a motion for Jill to continue as chair. Second. Thank you guys, that's nice of you. All those in favor. Oh, I have to say that. All those in favor. Let's go around the room. Nikki. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Katie. Aye. Drew. Aye. Thank you. Appreciate the vote of confidence. Um, and how about a motion for the vice chair? I'm like, do you want to list your vote though on, on <laughs> you or you can abstain from <laughs> your vote? Oh. Yeah. It sounds I, like you I, either win or lose. D yeah. depending on your interpretation oh, right because if i abstain it's a yes anyway so i'll just say yes yeah sorry i thought i said something like yeah yeah <laughs> or i okay i so that motion is passed i guess i retain this position as chair we'll get you well trained nikki <laughs> and thank you um so then katie for the next motion yeah so i make a motion um for nikki mccord as vice chair Second. Thank you, Maureen. All right, here we go. Drew. Aye. Your... Katie. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Nikki. 
Aye. Jill, aye. Okay. So we now have a chair and a new vice chair. And thank you um, guys, all and, ladies. Uh, <laughs> and thank, thank you all for the nomination. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate your service as well. And I will edit these. I mean, Devin, if you can figure out what Amanda, so I got these from Cindy and they have a bunch of typos in there. So I don't want to give them to her with a typo. If you happen to have the original, I'll look and see. I may even have it in my email. Um, that would be great. And then so that that's in a usable form for the next time we have a meeting. So that's all we have. Um, anything from you, Robbie? Okay, thank you. I rose my hand, just didn't want the meeting to end. Um, I just have a real quick update and I'm not sure, Devin, if you have anything to follow, but mine is yesterday was the application deadline and it looks like we do have at least one that came in. Um, I haven't done a completeness check on that, a formal one, so that's still pending. And then also depending on what the applicant tonight decides to do with their application, um, that could very well go in May or June. And just while I have all of you, May and June, um, I saw a couple, I won't be here July, September, et cetera. May and June, are we good to go when it comes to having a quorum or even a full board based on today? I know things change, but I'm just curious if May and June look okay for everybody. I'll be here May and June. Just in case it comes back in May or June. I'll be here. Yes. So far, okay. yes. Okay, thank you. Maureen, what about you? Yeah, I'll be there in, in May and June. Okay. And Drew? Yeah, me as well. Okay. But not in July, so. Right, uh, you and I are probably out both July and August. I mean, I actually think I'm here. I, I'm here till July um, 12th. I'm leaving the day after the June one, so if there's no meeting, it'll be <laughs> well appreciated, but... <laughs> We'll see. Thank you, everybody. I think I'm in the same boat. I think I'm flying out the day after the BOZA meeting next time. Yeah. Like tomorrow. I am flying too. All right. Great. Thanks, everybody. And Erin, are you good? Do you have anything else for us? Nope. Nothing else. Thank you. Thanks for your wise counsel as always. Appreciate it. Everybody have a great month. Thank you all. The meeting is Thank next you. Time. Thank you. Meet you all. Bye. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.